Okay, let's have a look at another game from the winner of the event, Levon Aronian. And this shows, you know, he can use provocation, seemingly solid position, but I'm not sure for a long time what the plan was. But then, out of nowhere, comes this pass pawn, which seems to be uh, virtually unstoppable. So here was Black, he played very ultra solid, you know, stuff, c6. So the, the Slav rears its head, even in blitz. So, after Queen C2, uh, we have taking on C4, <laughs> okay, so, uh, it's kind of provocation, it releases Black's position a bit, I guess, it's provocation in that, you know, is White tempted later to try and strike through the centre with these two pawns, uh, but after Bishop F5, you know, the bishops are both sorted, actually, they're both active, and this bishop's annoyingly eyeing this diagonal, Throughout most of the game, so Bishop G2, Bishop E7. How can we fault Black's position? He's got nice control over E4. Um, he's got kind of basically like a London system in reverse. So Rook D1, Knight BD7, and that's fairly solid. So E3 here from White. Okay, now H6, tucking away that Bishop. You know, like a London system player would would do. You know just in case there's knight h4 and he wants to keep the bishop so the bishop can be kept and in fact it plays an annoying uh, move now bishop c2 just to disrupt the rook from the d file for the moment then it tucks away neatly on h7 what can we say what can we say about this black position it's it's solid it's dull it's it's Aronian all over you know how can we beat you know Aronian how can white play dynamically to smash him up I mean, I know we really want to, you know, crush black positions like this. They seem, you know, flat, boring, lifeless. But, um, and it seems White was, was doing a good job in this game. But somehow, a pass pawn came out of nowhere. So, Queen E2. Black plays now Knight E4. Again, you know, w what is the plan here? Just to exchange off pieces? To grind White into dust in the end game? What is the plan? You know, is is the creative plan? It's it's hardly King's Engine territory, is it? You know, act, without the action-packed adventure, but there is stuff going on for Black. You know, these bishops are still, you know, kind of, you know, active. Can we say Black's Black's pawn structure is kind of solid, I guess. All right, Knight D two, get a couple of knights off. What does it achieve? After Knight F six again. You know, Black's got reasonable control over e4, although he seems to be potentially encouraging, you know, a central breakthrough now with, like, e4 and d5 if White can prepare it. And that's what White thought, you know, just just smash Black through the centre. No big deal. Rook a d1. But here is an ominous sign sent, sent out with this next move. a5. This pawn, believe it or not, is destined to, to be a total menace later on in this game. I know it's hard to imagine, but it's true. E4, A4, it's only three steps away from queening. So what happens in order for it to queen, especially after A3, it's restrained, isn't it? It's restrained by this pawn. So if we knocked out this pawn, then this pawn would be free to run. Let's think about this ultimately. How do we knock out this pawn? Well, if there was a capture on C3 and takes, then bishop takes A3, that would be knocking out that pawn. Something to bear in mind for later. Queen b6, bishop e3. White continues, you know, just smash black through the center. Black's position is dull and lifeless. Black doesn't deserve to be on the board, surely. So queen a6. Okay, so white just takes, and then d5, yeah, just, just blow black away. d5, why not? And and also, you know, what about e6 and c6? These are these are vulnerable now. And e6 in particular is near the king. You know, getting bishop h3. This is going to be a disaster for black, surely. Rook d8 was played. Now bishop f1. Yeah, chase this rook away, just in case rook b6 is handy. And now bishop b6. Okay. So white's played that, you know, thematic kind of breakthrough. One would think is thematic. You know, smash black with d5. Surely that is the thematic way of playing this position. Okay, rook d7. Whoops! Has black just put himself in a major pin here? 
bishop h3. Now how would you assess this position? White's coordinated both rooks on, on the centre. His bishops are kind of nice. He's played for that d5 break. Isn't, isn't Black's position uh, critical here? Rivka even thinks White was was clearly better, but somehow Levon, he's this position is just about to transform itself, with Black having a very valuable asset, the A4 pawn, believe it or not, and it's all triggered now after this Rook A6, because Rook A6 in effect wins E4, which causes a capture on C3 which causes this A3 pawn to go, which causes this A pawn to be a menace. Seriously, this is what happened. Bishop E3, because Bishop D4, Black just takes on D5 and then takes it, and he's fine, There's no, the, the pin is not working there. So Bishop E3, so Black takes on E4 now, and he doesn't even mind the seemingly frightening D takes E6, as though his position is on the brink. He just simply captures on d1, he doesn't care about the check. Now he takes on c3, and you notice now the blockade is going of this a pawn. Um, so, so king f8 first though, it's, it's too dangerous otherwise uh, to take on a3 at the moment. Rook d7, although this looks fairly dangerous, doesn't it? This position, because th there was actually uh, rook d8 would have been mating, because that bishop's actually hemming in the king. So bishop takes a3 as rook d8 mates. So that's a small technical detail about king f8. Okay, so rook d7, now take the pawn. The blockaders, um, sorry, take the pawn on e6 first. Now finally take the pawn on a3. And black's whole position justifies itself. The rook is justified. The bishops are justified. Everything is now working towards this common goal, this a pawn queening. It's all starting to make sense. Rook f7 check. Okay, lose a couple of pawns. You know, it's no big deal. We want to optimize this pawn, you know, queening. So, bishop d6. The pawn's ready to run now. Okay. Rook takes g7. Okay, it's all time to get the pawn queening. Bishop c2. So, the bishop's got a nice point on b3 to gain tempo with. Bishop takes h6. White's in the race as well, apparently, now, with the h-pawn. So a3, bishop a2, blockade. But now unblockade, rook b6. So unblockade, bishop b3. Bishop g5, unblocking for the h-pawn to start running. Bishop b3. It's starting to look a bit unpleasant for White. There's a serious problem here. This a-pawn is only two steps away from queening now. So here, bishop e3, not bothering to move the rook, just c5. And also this c pawn is ready to run as well, just needs to get rid of this blockader. This could all happen. These blockaders can be removed. Bishop takes b3, rook takes b3. Now after rook a7, yes, the other c pawn is another candidate pass pawn for queening now. Rook takes c3. So we've got two, two pass pawns, they're not connected. But White's, you know, got a candidate as well, so he starts using that, h4. So we have another pawn race. I said, you know, after my horrible loss, we should get good at these pawn races. And this is another pawn race, but there's two against one here. Seems a bit unfair. c4, h5. Now, talk about Dr. Optimum here. Okay, there's, there's two past pawns. Guess what Black played now? If I give you um, 10 seconds uh, to have a look at this position. Okay, starting from now. Think about Dr. Optimum, you know, and past pawns. Okay, Aronian just plays Rook takes e3. These past pawns are actually lethal here. Uh, you know, if, if white takes now, then just c3. H how is c2 stopped? The rook hasn't got c7. If it moves, then, then it's going to be like a2 as well. Or, or king d7 to stop even rook c8 if check. So uh, this, this is terrible for white now. This is absolutely critical because of that c3. So so white just plays h6, trying to get his own pawn going. 
I know this story already. Rookie six was played. In fact, checking with Ribka, there's an even more. There's two more crushing moves than rookie six. The most spectacular is just rook takes g3 check. So if f takes, then bishop c5 check, picking up the rook and then coming back to d4. End of game. Or there's simply rook e1 as well check with the idea of bishop e5. But this is good as well. This wins as well. Rook e6. The rook can just sacrifice itself naturally for the pawn. These two pawns are winning the game for black. So rook h6 here doesn't matter about losing the rook. Lose the rook doesn't matter. C2. These two pawns are going to win for black. Now a2. There's no stopping them. Bishop a3 and c1, or bishop d4 and a1. There's no stopping them. King f3. Now bishop a3 and white had enough. He resigned. What can we say about such a game? I mean, black played ultra solid, but was able to come up with a decisive trump card in the form of that a pawn, which looked like nothing. Middle game. It looked like you know it's totally blocked. What prospects possibly? Has Black got here for this a pawn? But um, he allowed this, you know, seemingly uh, effective breakthrough in the centre, and this uh, seemingly effective pin, putting the position on the brink. But in the midst of all this comes the, this knight e4, which starts to transform the entire position uh, because of this, you know, latent dynamism of the a pawn. So these exchanges. The critical king f8 stopped being mated. Okay, he lost, the, uh, you know, he, a couple of pawns on his, on his second rank. But now the a pawn, which is soon to be joined by the c pawn, comes into effect, and this beautiful rook takes e3. Very optimally, uh, you know, going to queen these pawns because of the c menacing c3 threat now. So white tries to use his candidate pawn, but it's too late. You know, black can just sacrifice a rook. It's that old story. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.